In the words of St. Francis of Assisi, when he met St. Dominic on the road to Umbria, hi. <laughs> <laughs> It's wonderful to be with you. And in these three days, we want to think together about this with God kind of life. This morning, I want to try to cast a little larger picture of the means of grace for the transformation of the human personality. And then tomorrow, a little more specifically on how meditative prayer is the sanctuary of the soul. And then finally on Friday, to cast this into the issue of life and how we might live it with confidence under God. So let's pray. Lord, we ask that you be our teacher. Teach us to stop and listen. Teach us to center down. Teach us to be collected. And if it would please you to use any words that I might say, I'd be grateful. But more than any other thing, May we today hear your word, whether through my words or beyond them. Help us, O oh Lord, to hear the Debar Yahweh. For we ask it in the good name of Jesus. Amen. Albert Einstein, the great physicist who gave us the mathematical equation for the theory of relativity, was on a train, and when the conductor came by to collect the tickets, he, he couldn't find his ticket. Well, the conductor recognized who it was, you know, <laughs> and he said, oh, Dr. Einstein, you don't need to find your ticket. I trust you. And he went on. About a half an hour later, he came back. By this time, Einstein is down on his hands and knees looking under the seat for that ticket. And uh, the conductor said, Dr. Einstein, didn't you hear me? I, you don't need to find your ticket. I trust you. And Einstein <laughs> looked up at him and said, young man, it's not a matter of trust. It's a matter of direction. I don't know where I'm going. Now, do you know where you're going? Do you have clarity about the goal of the Christian life? That is to be formed and conformed and transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. This is the penultimate goal of the Christian life. You remember Paul said to the Galatians, I am in travail. That's a birthing image. I am in travail until Christ be formed in you. That's what we mean when we speak of spiritual formation. To the Romans, Paul said, those whom God foreknew, them he predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. You and I, we are predestined to be like Jesus, and God is intent upon that purpose and that goal in our lives, and he is not going to let go of that goal. He is going to keep with us, forming us, conforming us, transforming us into the image of his Son. And the amazing thing is that God has invited you and me to be participators in this great work 
of the formation of the soul, the growth of the life into Christ's likeness. We have been given opportunity to work in cooperation with God, co-laborers, as Paul puts it, working together to see a life change. You see, the opposite of faith is works because that has to do with earning, of course. There's not a thing we can do to earn the grace of God. So the opposite of faith is works, but not effort. As Jesus said, we are to strive to enter in at the narrow gate. And so I want us to think a little bit about some of these means of grace that God has given us. You remember Jonathan Edwards often spoke of God as a God of means. And John Wesley actually used the term means of grace. And so I want to think with you a little bit about that. And uh, that little blue card with its outline will give you some direction of where I plan to go. And the first that I mention there is the intentional means of grace. Now, any of you who have ever read William Law's serious call to a devout and holy life know that I have taken that phrase straight from him. He would often speak of intention. What is your intention? Maybe I could put it this way. Are you intending to sin? People say, oh, well, no. But now we must ask it the other way. Are you intending not to sin? Because we have, if we have not made intentions not to sin, we are intending to sin. And it is the classical disciplines of the spiritual life that God has given to us to allow us to bring this little individualized power pack that we call the human body and place it before God as a living sacrifice. Now, of course, the problem with living sacrifices is that they are always trying to crawl off the altar. And that's why they take a lifetime to be offered. You remember Paul's words to Timothy, exercise yourself unto godliness. Now that word, exorcizo, has as its background the Greek gymnasium, where the athletes would train for the games, which is why the early Christians spoke of themselves as the athletia dei, the athletes of God. And so it is through the disciplines of the spiritual life that we are learning to train. And there's a difference between trying and training, learning to train unto godliness. Now, I want to give just a couple of counsels as we begin into that life, and you can understand that I'm giving a recipe for an entire life's work. We're all at this. And my first counsel is this, begin small. Don't try to be heroic about this kind of thing. I always, when I was your age, I'd try to be heroic, and I'd get spiritual indigestion all the time from it. And it's important to catch a hold of the vision of the small corners of life. George Washington Carver was one of the great scientists of our country, and he often prayed. And he called God Mr. Creator. And one night he went out into the woods and he prayed, Mr. Creator, why did you make the universe? And he listened, and this is what he heard. Little man, that question is too big for you. Try another. And the next night he went out and he prayed, Mr. Creator, why did you make man, that is the human race? And he heard this, little man, that question is still too big for you. 
try another. And the next night, he went out and he prayed, Mr. Creator, why did you make the peanut? And he heard this, little man, that question is just your size. You listen, and I'll teach you. And you may know that George Washington Carver invented some 300 ways to use the peanut. So that's my first counsel. Begin small. But my second counsel is this. Do begin. John Wesley said, all begin. Fix some part of every day for private exercises. Whether you like it or no, read and pray daily. It is for your life. There is no other way, else you will be a trifler all your days. So there's the intentional means of grace. The second area is titled the instrumental means of grace. And if you look on the back side of that blue card, you will see what I'm talking about the ways by which God takes the physical world in which we live, including human beings who are part of that world, to mediate his grace. You might remember Paul's words in Romans 5.13, present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. Now, members, he means your arms, your legs, your mind, who you are, as instruments of righteousness. Now, here's my counsel on that. <clears throat> it does not depend upon the skill of the instrument, but upon the grace of God. Okay? It does not depend upon the skill of the instrument, but upon the grace of God. And I want to give you a story of the first time I really understood this. And I'm going to take you way, way back, all the way to 1970. I was pastoring a little church that would rank as a marginal failure on the ecclesiastical scoreboards. <laughs> I mean, it was awful. <laughs> the conservatives, they were mad at the liberals. The liberals, they were mad at the radicals. The radicals, God bless them, they were just mad. <laughs> <laughs> and I spoke one Sunday on tragedy. And afterwards, I was greeting folk, and there was a middle-aged sort of man, tough-looking fellow but I noticed a tear in his eye, and he said, I'd like to speak to you sometime. And I said, sure, and I went to see him on a Thursday night. Oh, I was so rigid in those days. I had a, I had a system I wanted to lay on him, you know, make him a Christian. I couldn't get a word in edgewise. He began to share with me about this deep sadness how that for 26 years he'd been in a kind of depression. He would wake up in the middle of the night screaming in a cold sweat, hadn't slept well for 26 years. And you can imagine what sleep deprivation does to a person. And he shared with me how that 26 years ago, now way back then, that would have put it into the Second World War. He was a ranger in Italy in charge of 33 men. Went out on a mission, got pinned down by the enemy. He told me that he'd prayed desperately that God would get him out of that mess. It wasn't to be. He had to send his men out two by two and watch them get killed. He saw them die, until finally in the early 
hours of the morning, he was able to escape with six men. Four of them were critically injured. All he had was a little flesh wound. He told me he'd become an atheist out of that experience. I don't think he was an atheist. I think he was angry with God, full of guilt. Well, I listened to that little story, and my heart went out to him. And I went over, and I sat on the couch beside him, and I, <laughs> I placed my hand on his shoulder. That was my shy way of the laying on of hands. And I prayed a childlike little prayer. I didn't know how else to do it. I said, you see what this man's been through. You see what has happened. Would you walk through that day with him and let him know that you were there, that you never leave him, that you never forsake him? And would you draw out that guilt See, this man had just made confession to me. All of that anger, all of that hurt, and set him free. And I don't know, I just thought of it. I said, I'd so appreciate it if one of the evidences of this healing work is that he will be able to sleep all night long. Amen. Well, we talked back and forth for a little while. After about half an hour, he turned to his wife, and he said, you know, honey, I, I, I feel good. I haven't said that for 26 years, have I? She said, no, you haven't. I thought, mm hmm But I didn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> I did give him a little gospel of John, and I left. That was on a Thursday night. Sunday morning... There he was in the church house. Second time in 26 years he'd been in a church building. He was three feet off the ground. He walked up. He got a hold of me. He lifted me in the air. He says, I have slept all night long for three nights straight. And every morning I would wake up with a hymn on my mind. Isn't that wonderful? But I thought, God, what are you doing? I haven't given him the stuff yet. <laughs> I didn't know his theology, and I had a good system, and he didn't know my system. And I says, I want to meet with you. So I went back the next Thursday night determined to give him my system. And I tried. I really tried, but I could not get a word in. This man had taken that little gospel of John and had read it through three times that week. And he was teaching me. He'd go, oh, look at this, look at this. And he'd read a passage. Oh, look at this one, look at this one. And he'd read another story. Now, I'm not making this up. This actually happened. He said, have you ever heard about this thing called being born again? And he turned to the third chapter of the Gospel of John and read to me the story of Nicodemus in Jesus' words, you must be born from above. Saving faith had come into this man without my system. So I thought, I'll get his wife. And the wonderful thing is that she came into saving faith before I could ever get to her. Now, that was, what, 30-some years ago now. And while this man has had the normal ups and downs of ordinary human beings, those old fears, that old sadness has never returned. It does not depend upon the skill of the instrument, but upon the grace of God. The third area on that sheet is called the experiential means of grace. And let me just turn to the third one of those, the trials that produce a patient 
endurance. Remember those wonderful words of James, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy. Now, why did James say that? Is he some kind of masochist or something? No. He understood something of the nature of the formation of the heart and mind and soul before God. Consider it nothing but joy, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Endurance. What George Fox called being established men and women. The old writers had a word for that. Fortitude. It's one of the cardinal virtues. And let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. Now, let me try to describe it this way. God gives to us wonderful and glorious promises. And in one sense, everything that God gives to us, he gives in promise form. And it is God's intention that those promises be brought into fulfillment, into completion, into provision. But between the promise and the provision, God places a problem. Now, we think, what a nasty thing to put between a promise and a provision. But you understand that God knows better than we do about these matters. Because, you see, to receive the provision before we are ready can destroy us. That's what happened to the prodigal son, isn't it? He got his provision before he was ready for it. Now, this process of the promise and the problem and the provision can be found all through Scripture and all through human life. Just a couple of examples from the Bible. Think of Joseph. You remember him in the Old Testament? Remember the promise to Joseph? Sun, moon, and stars bowing down to him. Sheaves bowing down to him. Joseph says, how can a guy be humble with dreams like that? And God says, I'll show you. <laughs> and by the time, you remember what happened, don't you? His uh, betrayal, sold into slavery, imprisonment. By the time his brothers bowed down to him, Joseph was a different person. Promise, problem, provision. Think of Moses. Remember the promise to Moses? Deliverer of the people. And Moses says, right, tries to do it. Kills the Egyptian, doesn't work. God has to tuck him into the desert for 40 years to learn to do the work of God in the power of the Spirit. That is the hidden preparation through which God puts his ministers. Promise, problem, provision. Think of Paul in the New Testament. Saul, who became Paul, remember him? He's out killing Christians, and then he gets knocked off his donkey. Remember, blinded? Remember the story? And he says, I love this passage in the Bible. He says, he says, <laughs> who is it, Lord? I think I'd say Lord, too. It is Jesus whom you're persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the pricks. And you remember how he fasts for three days, and then he goes to the street called Straight, where Ananias, he meets him, and, and those great words of grace, I don't know that I could have said them. He says, 
brother Saul. Can you imagine? I think I at least would have said, you rascal. Brother Saul, and you remember how the eyesight returns? How he's wonderfully converted. And then he's given that great promise. Remember it? Apostle to the Gentiles. And right in that promise, we hear the problem. I will show him what great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Promise, problem, provision. Think of Mary in the New Testament. Remember Mary? Remember the promise to Mary? Mother of Messiah. And then we hear those words, that agonizing problem. This shall pierce thine own soul also. And we see Mary at the foot of the cross watching her own son die. Promise problem, provision. Oh, Lord, here we are, and different ones in this room at different places, and some are right in the middle of the problem of life. We're not asking that you take them out of it, but that you be with them in it, with us in it. May we learn to walk with you through the days of glory and the days of great agony and trial. May your word and your life be over us, each one. For we ask it in the good and the strong name of Jesus Christ, our ever-living Savior, Teacher, Lord, and Friend. Amen. Amen. You are at liberty.